public sector has to play a role. We can't just say uh, the private sector uh, will take care of itself. Connected vehicle standards have been under development at the U.S. Department of Transportation. If we, if we had a connected vehicle standard that was officially regulatory today, what I mean by that is every new vehicle had to have that, that signal box that sent out how fast it's going, where it is, and where it's turning. We would have a wave of private sector innovation because this, in, this in, just like the, the internet created a wave of innovation, having these signals would, would allow vehicle, vehicle manufacturers, would allow software developers to develop software that would make us safer, that would speed up traffic. Um, we, it's the information that would allow the private sector to innovate. By not having these connected vehicle standards adopted, and, and they, originally the, the plan was for adopting them in 2017, now we're, you know, in 2018, I haven't heard anything about whether there's going to be a connected vehicle standard adopted. We're slowing down the implementation of this technology. Um, federal, uh, the, the federal government released a policy uh, on automated vehicles in 2016. I would say this is a quite, uh, two minutes? Okay. Uh, just trying to think. I, I want to focus on, on states and, 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 and local. Um, Arguably, we could say there is a race to the bottom in terms of automated vehicles. A lot of the testing is going on is in Arizona because that has the state with the least regulation. Um, Florida is also has, has a little regulation. Um, so what do we have? We have a reactive rather than proactive response to automated vehicle safety. Um, right now, we still have states licensing drivers. Licensing may become more important as we have um, high levels of automation because you have to worry about whether people understand that they have to be able to take over control of the vehicle, uh, the, the understanding of the driver that, that this system is not fail safe, that they have to be ready to take over control is, a, is an educational issue, so we may need more licensing in the short term. But in the long term, as these vehicles become fully automated, we, won't need, we presumably won't need driver's licensing at all. So you know, I think in the long run, licensing is going to go away. Um, safety, safety issues may be best handled by the feds rather than having a state-by-state -state, uh, <coughs> patchwork. I, I focus most of my research and, and, and teaching on metro and local policy, so this is where uh, my interests are. Um, I think you know the idea that we should build walkable urban places is is robust. It will work no matter what kind of uh, automation we have. We're still going to want to be able to get out of the car and walk the last quarter mile, walk the last half mile. We're still going to want to be safe. We're still going to be want to want to have pedestrians and bicyclists uh, be able to be you know active, physically fit, move around, enjoy public spaces. Uh, lower parking requirements is already today. This is before automated vehicles. This is already a good public policy, but all the point, all the evidence points that we're going to need less parking. And if you if you have fixed that parking and you build it, and that you know, and that site lasts for 50 years, it's going to be hard to you know take that parking away. Maybe one thing you can do is you can plan for parking that can be partially phased out uh, over time. Integrate public transit into your mode. This is the hardest of the of the, all the recommendations I'm talking about. This is the hardest one to do. Uh, public transit tends to have slow uh, planning cycles, tends to be slow to innovate. We've got shared mobility uh, people in the bicycle and, and shared bikes and, and, and uh, Uber and Via and Lyft who are innovating rapidly. But these systems are, co are inherently complementary to each other. And I, and I don't think we can get the most out of either system without them being planned together. So this is really, you know, this is the heaviest lift. Uh, uh, thinking about public transit and shared mobility as a single integrated system. Invest in major transportation infrastructure conservatively, and I think this applies to both roadways uh, and transit. Uh, I do think the best transit investments are going to be those that are high speed uh, and dedicated right of ways and high capacity. Uh, so, so for example, Brightline, I think that is going to maintain its value. Uh, we're not going to be able to get the same speeds and the same capacity on roadways any time in the foreseeable future. So I do think there's certain kinds of transit that are going to maintain their value. And you know, again, don't want to pick too many fights here, but the streetcar is probably not, I don't think, going to maintain its, its value long term. I, I just don't, I mean, in terms of the flexibility that we're going to have, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, the ability we're going to be able to leverage new forms of shared mobility, I just don't see that as a, uh, as a uh, long term uh, sustainable uh, transportation investment. Okay, so now that I've stirred up the hornet's nest, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to the next speaker. <laughs> Thank you.